From all this material, I prepared a short talk. I called it, How to Win Friends and Influence People, I say, short. It was short in the beginning, but it soon expanded to a lecture that consumed one hour and thirty minutes. For years, I gave this talk each season to the adults in the Carnegie Institute courses in New York. I gave the talk and urged the listeners to go out and test it in the business and social contacts, and then come back to class and speak about their experiences and the results they had achieved. What an interesting assignment. These men and women, hungry for self-improvement, were fascinated by the idea of working in a new kind of laboratory, the first and only laboratory of human relationships for adults that had ever existed. This book wasn't written in the usual sense of the word. It grew as a child grows. It grew and developed out of that laboratory, out of the experiences of thousands of adults. Years ago, we started with a set of rules printed on a card no larger than a postcard. The next season we printed a larger card, then a leaflet, then a series of booklets, each one expanding in size and scope. After 15 years of experiment and research came this book. The rules we have set down here are not mere theories or guesswork. They work like magic. Incredible as it sounds, I have seen the application of these principles literally revolutionize the lives of many people. To illustrate, a man with 314 employees joined one of these courses. For years, he had driven and criticized and condemned his employees without stint or discretion. Kindness, words of appreciation and encouragement were alien to his lips. After studying the principles discussed in this book, this employer sharply altered his philosophy of life. His organization is now inspired with a new loyalty, a new enthusiasm, a new spirit of teamwork. 314 enemies have been turned into 314 friends. As he proudly said in a speech before the class, when I used to walk through my establishment, no one greeted me. My employees actually looked the other way when they saw me approaching. But now they are all my friends and even the janitor calls me by my first name. This employer gained more profit, more leisure and what is infinitely more important he found far more happiness in his business and in his home. Countless numbers of salespeople have sharply increased their sales by the use of these principles. Many have opened up new accounts, accounts that they had formerly solicited in vain. Executives have been given increased authority, increased pay. And that was the killer who said, under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody any harm, Crowley was sentenced to the electric chair. When he arrived at the death house in Sing Sing, did he say, this is what I get for killing people? No, he said, this is what I get for defending myself. The point of the story is this, two gun, Crowley didn't blame himself for anything. Is that an unusual attitude among criminals? If you think so, listen to this, I have spent the best years of my life giving people the lighter pleasures, helping them have a good time, and all I get is abuse, the existence of a hunted man. That's Al Capone speaking. Yes, America's most notorious public enemy the most sinister gang leader who ever shot up Chicago. Capone didn't condemn himself. He actually regarded himself as a public benefactor, an unappreciated and misunderstood public benefactor. And so did Dutch Schultz before he crumpled up under gangster bullets in Newark. Dutch Schultz, one of New York's most notorious rats, said in a newspaper interview that he was a public benefactor. And he believed it. I have had some interesting correspondence with Lewis Laws, who was warden of New York's infamous Sing Sing prison for many years, on this subject, and he declared that, few of the criminals in Sing Sing regard themselves as bad men. They are just as human as you and I so they rationalize, they explain. They can tell you why they had to crack a safe or be quick on the trigger finger. Most of them attempt by a form of reasoning, fallacious or logical, to justify their antisocial acts even to themselves, consequently stoutly maintaining that they should never have been imprisoned at all. If Al Capone, Two Gun, Crowley, Dutch Schultz, and the desperate men and women behind prison walls don't blame themselves for anything, what about the people with whom you and I come in contact? John Wanamaker, founder of the stores that bear his name, once confessed, I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence, Wanamaker learned this lesson early, but I personally had to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100, people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it may be. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous, because it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. 
B. F. Skinner, the world-famous psychologist, proved through his experiments that an animal rewarded for good behavior will learn much more rapidly and retain what it learns far more effectively than an animal punished for bad behavior. Later studies have shown that the same applies to humans. By criticizing, we do not make lasting changes and often incur resentment. Hans Selye, another great psychologist, said, as much as we thirst for approval, we dread condemnation. The resentment that criticism engenders can demoralize employees, family members and friends, and still not correct the situation that has been condemned. George B. Johnston of Enid, Oklahoma, is the safety coordinator for an engineering company. One of his responsibilities is to see that employees wear their hard hats whenever they are on the job in the field. He reported that whenever he came across workers who were not wearing hard hats, he would tell them with a lot of authority of the regulation and that they must comply. As a result he would get sullen acceptance, and often after he left, the workers would remove the hats. He decided to try a different approach. The next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hard hat, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or did not fit properly. Then he reminded the men in a pleasant tone of voice that the hat was designed to protect them from injury and suggested that it always be worn on the job. The result was increased compliance with the regulation with no resentment or emotional upset. You will find examples of the futility of criticism bristling on a thousand pages of history. Take, for example, the famous quarrel between Theodore Roosevelt and President Taft, a quarrel that split the Republican Party, put Woodrow Wilson in the White House, and wrote bold, luminous lines across the First World War and altered the flow of history. Let's review the facts quickly. When Theodore Roosevelt stepped out of the White House in 1908, he supported Taft, who was elected president. Then Theodore Roosevelt went off to Africa to shoot lions. When he returned, he exploded. He denounced Taft for his conservatism, tried to secure the nomination for a third term himself, formed the Bull Moose Party, and all but demolished the GOP. In the election that followed, William Howard Taft and the Republican Party carried only two states, Vermont and Utah. The most disastrous defeat the party had ever known. Theodore Roosevelt blamed Taft, but did President Taft blame himself? Of course not, with tears in his eyes, Taft said, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have, who was to blame? Roosevelt or Taft? Frankly, I don't know, and I don't care. The point I am trying to make is that all of Theodore Roosevelt's criticism didn't persuade Taft that he was wrong. It merely made Taft strive to justify himself and to reiterate with tears in his eyes, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have, or, take the teapot dome oil scandal. It kept the newspapers ringing with indignation in the early 1920s. It rocked the nation. Within the memory of living men, nothing like it had ever happened before in American public life. Here are the bare facts of the scandal. Albert B. Fall, Secretary of the Interior in Harding's cabinet, was entrusted with the leasing of government oil reserves at Elk Hill and Teapot Dome, oil reserves that had been set aside for the future use of the Navy. Did Secretary Fall permit competitive bidding? No sir. He handed the fat, juicy contract outright to his friend Edward L. Doheny. And what did Doheny do? He gave Secretary Fall what he was pleased to call a loan of $100,000. Then, in a high-handed manner, Secretary Fall ordered United States Marines into the district to drive off competitors whose adjacent wells were sapping oil out of the Elk Hill reserves. These competitors, driven off the ground at the ends of guns and bayonets, rushed into court and blew the lid off the Teapot Dome scandal. A stench arose so vile that it ruined the Harding administration, nauseated an entire nation, threatened to wreck the Republican Party, and put Albert B. Fall behind prison bars. Fall was condemned viciously, condemned as few men in public life have ever been. Did he repent? Never. Years later Herbert Hoover intimated in a public speech that President Harding's death had been due to mental anxiety and worry because a friend had betrayed him. When Mrs. Fall heard that, she sprang from her chair, she wept, she shook her fists at fate and screamed, what? Harding betrayed by Fall? No. My husband never betrayed anyone. This whole house full of gold would not tempt my husband to do wrong. He is the one who has been betrayed and led to the slaughter and crucified, there you are, human nature in action, wrongdoers, blaming everybody but themselves. We are all like that. So when you and I attempted to criticize someone tomorrow, let's remember Al Capone, Two Gun, Crowley and Albert Fall. Let's realize that criticisms are like homing pigeons.
they always return home. Let's realize that the person we are going to correct and condemn will probably justify himself or herself, and condemn us in return, or, like the gentle Taft, will say, I don't see how I could have done any differently from what I have. On the morning of April 15, 1865, Abraham Lincoln lay dying in a hall bedroom of a cheap lodging house directly across the street from Ford's Theater, where John Wilkes Booth had shot him. Lincoln's long body lay stretched diagonally across a sagging bed that was too short for him. A cheap reproduction of Rosa Bonheur's famous painting The Horse Fair hung above the bed, and a dismal gas jet flickered yellow light. As Lincoln lay dying, Secretary of War Stanton said, There lies the most perfect ruler of men that the world has ever seen. What was the secret of Lincoln's success in dealing with people? I studied the life of Abraham Lincoln for ten years and devoted all of three years to writing and rewriting a book entitled Lincoln the Unknown. I believe I have made as detailed and exhaustive a study of Lincoln's personality and home life as it is possible for any being to make. I made a special study of Lincoln's method of dealing with people. Did he indulge in criticism? Oh, yes. As a young man in the Pigeon Creek Valley of Indiana, he not only criticized but he wrote letters and poems ridiculing people and dropped these letters on the country roads where they were sure to be found. One of these letters aroused resentments that burned for a lifetime. Even after Lincoln had become a practicing lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, he attacked his opponents openly in letters published in the newspapers. But he did this just once too often. In the autumn of 1842 he ridiculed a vain, pugnacious politician by the name of James Shields. Lincoln lammed him through an anonymous letter published in Springfield Journal. The town roared with laughter. Shields, sensitive and proud, boiled with indignation. He found out who wrote the letter, leaped on his horse, started after Lincoln, and challenged him to fight a duel. Lincoln didn't want to fight. He was opposed to dueling, but he couldn't get out of it and save his honor. He was given the choice of weapons. Since he had very long arms, he chose cavalry broadswords and took lessons in sword fighting from a West Point graduate, and, on the appointed day, he and Shields met on a sandbar in the Mississippi River, prepared to fight to the death, but, at the last minute, the seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. That was the most lurid personal incident in Lincoln's life. It taught him an invaluable lesson in the art of dealing with people. Never again did he write an insulting letter. Never again did he ridicule anyone. And from that time on, he almost never criticized anybody for anything. Time after time, during the Civil War, Lincoln put a new general at the head of the Army of the Potomac, and each one in turn, McClellan, Pope, Burnside, Hooker, Meade, blundered tragically and drove Lincoln to pacing the floor in despair. Half the nation savagely condemned these incompetent generals, but Lincoln, with malice toward none, with charity for all, held his peace. One of his favorite quotations was, Judge not, that ye be not judged, and when Mrs. Lincoln and others spoke harshly of the Southern people, Lincoln replied, Don't criticize them, they are just what we would be under similar circumstances. Yet if any man ever had occasion to criticize, surely it was Lincoln. Let's take just one illustration, the Battle of Gettysburg was fought during the first three days of July 1863. During the night of July 4, Lee began to retreat southward while storm clouds deluged the country with rain. When Lee reached the Potomac with his defeated army, he found a swollen, impassable river in front of him, and a victorious Union army behind him. Lee was in a trap. He couldn't escape. Lincoln saw that. Here was a golden, heaven-sent opportunity the opportunity to capture Lee's army and end the war immediately. One executive reported a large increase in salary because he applied these truths. Another, an executive in the Philadelphia Gas Works Company, was slated for demotion when he was 65 because of his belligerence, because of his inability to lead people skillfully. This training not only saved him from the demotion but brought him a promotion with increased pay. On innumerable occasions, spouses attending the banquet given at the end of the course have told me that their homes have been much happier since their husbands or wives started this training. People are frequently astonished at the new results they achieve. It all seems like magic. In some cases, in their enthusiasm, they have telephoned me at my home on Sundays because they couldn't wait 48 hours to report their achievements at the regular session of the course. One man was so stirred by a talk on these principles that he sat a day far into the night discussing them with other members of the class. At three o'clock in the morning, the others went home. But he was so shaken by a realization of his own mistakes, so inspired by the vista of a new and richer world opening before him, that he was unable to sleep. He didn't sleep that night or the next day or the next night. Who was he? A naive, untrained individual ready to gush over any new theory that came along. No, far from it. 
He was a sophisticated dealer in art, very much the man about town, who spoke three languages fluently and was a graduate of two European universities. While writing this chapter, I received a letter from a German of the old school, an aristocrat whose forebears had served for generations as professional army officers under the Hohenzollerns. His letter, written from a transatlantic steamer, telling about the application of these principles, rose almost to a religious fervor. Another man, an old New Yorker, a Harvard graduate, a wealthy man, the owner of a large carpet factory, declared he had learned more in 14 weeks through this system of training about the fine art of influencing people than he had learned about the same subject during his four years in college. Absurd, laughable, fantastic, of course, you are privileged to dismiss this statement with whatever adjective you wish. I am merely reporting, without comment, a declaration made by a conservative and eminently successful Harvard graduate in a public address to approximately 600 people at the Yale Club in New York on the evening of Thursday, February 23, 1933. Compared to what we ought to be, said the famous Professor William James of Harvard, compared to what we ought to be, we are only half awake. We are making use of only a small part of our physical and mental resources. Stating the thing broadly, the human individual thus lives far within his limits. He possesses powers of various sorts which he habitually fails to use, those powers which you habitually fail to use. The sole purpose of this book is to help you discover, develop and profit by those dormant and unused assets. Education, said Dr. John G. Hibben, former president of Princeton University, is the ability to meet life's situations. If by the time you have finished reading the first three chapters of this book if you aren't then a little better equipped to meet life's situations, then I shall consider this book to be a total failure so far as you are concerned. For, the great aim of education, said Herbert Spencer, is not knowledge but action, and this is an action book. Dale Carnegie 1936, 9 suggestions on how to get the most out of this book If you wish to get the most out of this book, there is one indispensable requirement, one essential infinitely more important than any rule or technique. Unless you have this one fundamental requisite, a thousand rules on how to study will avail little, and if you do have this cardinal endowment, then you can achieve wonders without reading any suggestions for getting the most out of a book. What is this magic requirement? Just this, a deep, driving desire to learn, a vigorous determination to increase your ability to deal with people. How can you develop such an urge? By constantly reminding yourself how important these principles are to you. Picture to yourself how their mastery will aid you in leading a richer, fuller, happier and more fulfilling life. Say to yourself over and over, my popularity, my happiness and sense of worth depend to no small extent upon my skill in dealing with people, read each chapter rapidly at first to get a bird's eye view of it. You will probably be tempted then to rush on to the next one. But don't, unless you are reading merely for entertainment. But if you are reading because you want to increase your skill in human relations, then go back and reread each chapter thoroughly. In the long run, this will mean saving time and getting results. Stop frequently in your reading to think over what you are reading. Ask yourself just how and when you can apply each suggestion. Read with a crayon, pencil, pen, magic marker or highlighter in your hand. When you come across a suggestion that you feel you can use, draw a line beside it. If it is a four-star suggestion, then underscore every sentence or highlight it, or mark it with asterisk 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 asterisk, marking and underscoring a book makes it more interesting, and far easier to review rapidly. I knew a woman who had been office manager for a large insurance concern for 15 years. Every month, she read all the insurance contracts her company had issued that month. Yes, she read many of the same contracts over month after month, year after year. Why? because experience had taught her that that was the only way she could keep the provisions clearly in mind. I once spent almost two years writing a book on public speaking and yet I found I had to keep going back over it from time to time in order to remember what I had written in my own book. The rapidity with which we forget is astonishing. So, if you want to get a real, lasting benefit out of this book, don't imagine that skimming through it once will suffice. After reading it thoroughly, you ought to spend a few hours reviewing it every month, keep it on your desk in front of you every day. Glance through it often. Keep constantly impressing yourself with the rich possibilities for improvement that still lie in the offing. Remember that the use of these principles can be made habitual only by a constant and vigorous campaign of review and application. There is no other way. Bernard Shaw once remarked, if you teach a man anything, he will never learn. Shaw was right. Learning is an active process. We learn by doing. So, if you desire to master the principles you are studying in this book, do something about them. Apply these rules at every opportunity. If you don't you will forget them quickly.
only knowledge that is used sticks in your mind. You will probably find it difficult to apply these suggestions all the time. I know because I wrote the book, and yet frequently I found it difficult to apply everything I advocated. You would expect me to say, don't. But I will not, I am merely going to say, before you criticize them, read one of the classics of American journalism, Father Forgets. It originally appeared as an editorial in the People's Home Journal. We are reprinting it here with the author's permission, as condensed in the Reader's Digest, Father Forgets, is one of those little pieces which dashed off in a moment of sincere feeling, strikes an echoing chord in so many readers as to become a perennial reprint favorite. Since its first appearance, Father Forgets, has been reproduced, writes the author, W. Livingston Lahn, in hundreds of magazines and house organs, and in newspapers the country over. It has been reprinted almost as extensively in many foreign languages. I have given personal permission to thousands who wish to read it from school, church, and lecture platforms. It has been on the air on countless occasions and programs. Oddly enough, college periodicals have used it, and high school magazines. Sometimes a little piece seems mysteriously to click, this one certainly did, father forgets W. Livingston Land listen, son, I am saying this as you lie asleep, one little paw crumpled under your cheek and the blonde curls stickly wet on your damp forehead. I have stolen into your room alone. Just a few minutes ago, as I sat a day reading my paper in the library, a stifling wave of remorse swept over me. Guiltily I came to your bedside. There are the things I was thinking, son, I had been cross with you. I scolded you as you were dressing for school because you gave your face merely a dab with a towel. I took you to task for not cleaning your shoes. I called out angrily when you threw some of your things on the floor. At breakfast I found fault, too. You spilled things. You gulped down your food. You put your elbows on the table. You spread butter too thick on your bread. And as you started off to play and I made for my train, you turned and waved a hand and called, goodbye, daddy, and I frowned, and said in reply, hold your shoulders back. Then it began all over again in the late afternoon. As I came up the road, I spied you, down on your knees, playing marbles. There were holes in your stockings. I humiliated you before your boyfriends by marching you ahead of me to the house. Stockings were expensive, and if you had to buy them you would be more careful. Imagine that, son, from a father. Do you remember, later, when I was reading in the library, how you came in timidly, with a sort of hurt look in your eyes? When I glanced up over my paper, impatient at the interruption, you hesitated at the door. What is it you want? I snapped. You said nothing, but ran across in one tempestuous plunge, and threw your arms around my neck and kissed me, and your small arms tightened with an affection that God had set blooming in your heart and which even neglect could not wither. And then you were gone, pattering up the stairs. Well, son, it was shortly afterwards that my paper slipped from my hands and a terrible sickening fear came over me. What has habit been doing to me? The habit of finding fault, of reprimanding, this was my reward to you for being a boy. It was not that I did not love you, it was that I expected too much of youth. I was measuring you by the yardstick of my own years. And there was so much that was good and fine and true in your character. The little heart of you was as big as the dawn itself over the wide hills. This was shown by your spontaneous impulse to rush in and kiss me good night. Nothing else matters tonight, son. I have come to your bedside in the darkness, and I have knelt there, ashamed. It is a feeble atonement, I know you would not understand these things if I told them to you during your waking hours. But tomorrow I will be a real daddy. I will chum with you, and suffer when you suffer, and laugh when you laugh. I will bite my tongue when impatient words come. I will keep saying as if it were a ritual, he is nothing but a boy, a little boy. I am afraid I have visualized you as a man. Yet as I see you now, son, crumpled and weary in your cot, I see that you are still a baby. Yesterday you were in your mother's arms, your head on her shoulder. I have asked too much, too much. Instead of condemning people, let's try to understand them. Let's try to figure out why they do what they do. That's a lot more profitable and intriguing than criticism, and it breeds sympathy, tolerance and kindness. To know all is to forgive all. As Dr. Johnson said, God himself, sir, does not propose to judge man until the end of his days, why should you and I? Principle 1 Don't criticize, condemn or complain with a well thought out and educated way to add a solution, the big secret of dealing with people there is only one way under high heaven to get anybody to do anything. Did you ever stop to think of that? Yes, just one way. And that is by making the other person want to do it. Remember, there is no other way. Of course, you can make someone want to give you his watch by sticking a revolver in his ribs. 
you can make your employees give you cooperation until your back is turned by threatening to fire them. You can make a child do what you want it to do by a whip or a threat. But these crude methods have sharply undesirable repercussions. The only way I can get you to do anything is by giving you what you want. What do you want? Sigmund Freud said that everything you and I do springs from two motives, the sex urge and the desire to be great. John Dewey, one of America's most profound philosophers, phrased it a bit differently. Dr. Dewey said that the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important, remember that phrase, the desire to be important. It is significant. You are going to hear a lot about it in this book. What do you want? Not many things, but the few that you do wish, you crave with an insistence that will not be denied. Some of the things most people want include, 1. Health and the preservation of life. 2. Food. 3. Sleep. 4. Money and the things money will buy. 5. Life in the hereafter. 6. Sexual gratification. 7. The well-being of our children. 8. A feeling of importance. Almost all these wants are usually gratified all except one. But there is one longing, almost as deep, almost as imperious, as the desire for food or sleep, which is seldom gratified. It is what Freud calls the desire to be great. It is what Dewey calls the desire to be important. Lincoln once began a letter saying, everybody likes a compliment. William James said, the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be appreciated. He didn't speak, mind you, of the wish or the desire or the longing to be appreciated. He said the craving to be appreciated. Here is a gnawing and unfaltering human hunger, and the rare individual who honestly satisfies this heart hunger will hold people in the palm of his or her hand and even the undertaker will be sorry when he dies. The desire for a feeling of importance is one of the chief distinguishing differences between mankind and the animals. To illustrate, when I was a farm boy out in Missouri, my father bred fine Durick Jersey hogs and pedigreed white-faced cattle. We used to exhibit our hogs and white-faced cattle at the country fairs and livestock shows throughout the Middle West. For example, when you are displeased, it is much easier to criticize and condemn than it is to try to understand the other person's viewpoint. It is frequently easier to find fault than to find praise. It is more natural to talk about what Vaux want than to talk about what the other person wants. And so on, so, as you read this book, remember that you are not merely trying to acquire information. You are attempting to form new habits. Ah yes, you are attempting a new way of life. That will require time and persistence and daily application. So refer to these pages often. Regard this as a working handbook on human relations, and whenever you are confronted with some specific problem, such as handling a child, winning your spouse to your way of thinking, or satisfying an irritated customer, hesitate about doing the natural thing, the impulsive thing. This is usually wrong. Instead, turn to these pages and review the paragraphs you have underscored. Then try these new ways and watch them achieve magic for you. Offer your spouse, your child or some business associate a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating a certain principle. Make a lively game out of mastering these rules. The president of an important Wall Street bank once described, in a talk before one of my classes, a highly efficient system he used for self-improvement. This man had little formal schooling, yet he had become one of the most important financiers in America, and he confessed that he owed most of his success to the constant application of his homemade system. This is what he does, I'll put it in his own words as accurately as I can remember. For years I have kept an engagement book showing all the appointments I had during the day. My family never made any plans for me on Saturday night, for the family knew that I devoted a part of each Saturday evening to the illuminating process of self-examination and review and appraisal. After dinner I went off by myself, opened my engagement book, and thought over all the interviews, discussions and meetings that had taken place during the week. I asked myself, what mistakes did I make that time, what did I do that was right and in what way could I have improved my performance, what lessons can I learn from that experience, I often found that this weekly review made me very unhappy. I was frequently astonished at my own blunders. Of course, as the years passed, these blunders became less frequent. Sometimes I was inclined to pat myself on the back a little after one of these sessions. This system of self-analysis, self-education, continued year after year, did more for me than any other one thing I have ever attempted. It helped me improve my ability to make decisions, and it aided me enormously in all my contacts with people. I cannot recommend it too highly. Why not use a similar system to check up on your application of the principles discussed in this book? If you do, two things will result. First, you will find yourself engaged in an educational process that is both intriguing and priceless. 
Second, you will find that your ability to meet and deal with people will grow enormously. You will find at the end of this book several blank pages on which you should record your triumphs in the application of these principles. Be specific. Give names, dates, results. Keeping such a record will inspire you to greater efforts, and how fascinating these entries will be when you chance upon them some evening years from now. In order to get the most out of this book, a. Develop a deep, driving desire to master the principles of human relations, b. Read each chapter twice before going on to the next one. c. As you read, stop frequently to ask yourself how you can apply each suggestion, d. Underscore each important idea, e. Review this book each month. f. Apply these principles at every opportunity. Use this volume as a working handbook to help you solve your daily problems, g. Make a lively game out of your learning by offering some friend a dime or a dollar every time he or she catches you violating one of these principles, h. Check up each week on the progress you are making. Ask yourself what mistakes you have made, what improvement, what lessons you have learned for the future, i. Keep notes in the back of this book showing how and when you have applied these principles. A shortcut to distinction by Lowell Thomas This biographical information about Dale Carnegie was written as an introduction to the original edition of How to Win Friends and Influence People. It is reprinted in this edition to give the readers additional background on Dale Carnegie. It was a cold January night in 1935, but the weather couldn't keep them away. 2,500 men and women thronged into the Grand Ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in New York. Every available seat was filled by half past seven. At eight o'clock, the eager crowd was still pouring in. The spacious balcony was soon jammed. Presently even standing space was at a premium, and hundreds of people, tired after navigating a day in business, stood up for an hour and a half that night to witness, what? A fashion show, a six-day bicycle race or a personal appearance by Clark Gable. No these people had been lured there by a newspaper ad. Two evenings previously, they had seen this full-page announcement in the New York Sun staring them in the face, learn to speak effectively prepare for leadership old stuff. Yes, but believe it or not, in the most sophisticated town on earth, during a depression with 20% of the population on relief, 2,500 people had left their homes and hustled to the hotel in response to that ad. The people who responded were of the upper economic strata, executives, employers and professionals. These men and women had come to hear the opening gun of an ultra-modern, ultra-practical course in Effective Speaking and Influencing Men in Business, a course given by the Dale Carnegie Institute of Effective Speaking and Human Relations. Why were they there, these 2,500 businessmen and women? Because of a sudden hunger for more education because of the Depression. Apparently not, for this same course had been playing to packed houses in New York City every season for the preceding 24 years. During that time, more than 15,000 business and professional people had been trained by Dale Carnegie. Even large, skeptical, conservative organizations such as the Westinghouse Electric Company, the McGraw-Hill Publishing Company, the Brooklyn Union Gas Company, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers and the New York Telephone Company have had this training conducted in their own offices for the benefit of their members and executives. The fact that these people, 10 or 20 years after leaving grade school, high school or college, come and take this training is a glaring commentary on the shocking deficiencies of our educational system. What do adults really want to study? That is an important question, and in order to answer it, the University of Chicago, the American Association for Adult Education, and the United YMCA schools made a survey over a two-year period. That survey revealed that the prime interest of adults is health. It also revealed that the second interest is in developing skill in human relationships, they want to learn the technique of getting along with and influencing other people. They don't want to become public speakers, and they don't want to listen to a lot of high-sounding talk about psychology, they want suggestions they can use immediately in business, in social contacts and in the home. Even when he got to bed at midnight, he set the alarm for 3 o'clock. His father bred pedigreed Durick Jersey hogs, and there was danger, during the bitter cold nights, that the young pigs would freeze to death, so they were put in a basket, covered with a gunny sack, and set behind the kitchen stove. True to their nature, the pigs demanded a hot meal at 3 a.m. So when the alarm went off, Dale Carnegie crawled out of the blankets, took the basket of pigs out to their mother, waited for them to nurse, and then brought them back to the warmth of the kitchen stove. There were 600 students in State Teachers College, and Dale Carnegie was one of the isolated half-dozen who couldn't afford to board in town. He was ashamed of the poverty that made it necessary for him to ride back to the farm and milk the cows every night. 
He was ashamed of his coat, which was too tight, and his trousers, which were too short. Rapidly developing an inferiority complex, he looked about for some shortcut to distinction. He soon saw that there were certain groups in college that enjoyed influence and prestige, the football and baseball players and the chaps who won the debating and public speaking contests. Realizing that he had no flair for athletics, he decided to win one of the speaking contests. He spent months preparing his talks. He practiced as he sat a day in the saddle galloping to college and back, he practiced his speeches as he milked the cows, and then he mounted a bale of hay in the barn and with great gusto and gestures harangued the frightened pigeons about the issues of the day. But in spite of all his earnestness and preparation, he met with defeat after defeat. He was 18 at the time, sensitive and proud. He became so discouraged, so depressed, that he even thought of suicide. And then suddenly he began to win, not one contest, but every speaking contest in college. Other students pleaded with him to train them, and they won also. After graduating from college, he started selling correspondence courses to the ranches among the sand hills of western Nebraska and eastern Wyoming. In spite of all his boundless energy and enthusiasm, he couldn't make the grade. He became so discouraged that he went to his hotel room in Alliance, Nebraska, in the middle of the day, threw himself across the bed, and wept in despair. He longed to go back to college, he longed to retreat from the harsh battle of life, but he couldn't. So he resolved to go to Omaha and get another job. He didn't have the money for a railroad ticket, so he traveled on a freight train, feeding and watering two carloads of wild horses in return for his passage. After landing in South Omaha, he got a job selling bacon and soap and lard for Armour and Company. His territory was up among the Badlands and the Cow and Indian country of western South Dakota. He covered his territory by freight train and stage coach and horseback and slept in pioneer hotels where the only partition between the rooms was a sheet of muslin. He studied books on salesmanship, rode bucking broncos, played poker with the Indians, and learned how to collect money. And when, for example, an inland storekeeper couldn't pay cash for the bacon and hams he had ordered, Dale Carnegie would take a dozen pairs of shoes off his shelf, sell the shoes to the railroad men, and forward the receipts to Armour and Company. He would often ride a freight train a hundred miles a day. When the train stopped to unload freight, he would dash uptown, see three or four merchants, get his orders, and when the whistle blew, he would dash down the street again lickety-split and swing onto the train while it was moving. Within two years, he had taken an unproductive territory that had stood in the 25th place and had boosted it to first place among all the 29 car routes leading out of South Omaha. Armour and company offered to promote him, saying, you have achieved what seemed impossible. But he refused the promotion and resigned, went to New York, studied at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts, and toured the country, playing the role of Dr. Hartley in Polly of the Circus. He would never be a Booth or a Barrymore. He had the good sense to recognize that, so back he went to sales work, selling automobiles and trucks for the Packard Motor Car Company. He knew nothing about machinery and cared nothing about it. Dreadfully unhappy, he had to scourge himself to his task each day. He longed to have time to study, to write the books he had dreamed about writing back in college. So he resigned. He was going to spend his days writing stories and novels and support himself by teaching in a night school. Teaching what? As he looked back and evaluated his college work, he saw that his training in public speaking had done more to give him confidence, courage, poise and the ability to meet and deal with people in business than had all the rest of his college courses put together, so he urged the YMCA schools in New York to give him a chance to conduct courses in public speaking for people in business. What? Make orators out of business people. Absurd. The YMCA people knew. They had tried such courses and they had always failed. When they refused to pay him a salary of $2 a night, he agreed to teach on a commission basis and take a percentage of the net profits if there were any profits to take. And inside of three years they were paying him $30 a night on that basis, instead of two. The course grew. Other East heard of it, then other cities. Dale Carnegie soon became a glorified circuit rider covering New York, Philadelphia, Baltimore and later London and Paris. All the textbooks were too academic and impractical for the business people who flocked to his courses. Because of this he wrote his own book entitled Public Speaking and Influencing Men in Business. It became the official text of all the YMCA's as well as of the American Bankers Association and the National Credit Men's Association. Dale Carnegie claimed that all people can talk when they get mad. He said that if you hit the most ignorant man in town on the jaw and knock him down, he would get on his feet and talk with an eloquence, heat and emphasis that would have rivaled that world-famous orator William Jennings Bryan at the height of his career. 
He claimed that almost any person can speak acceptably in public if he or she has self-confidence and an idea that is boiling and stewing within. The way to develop self-confidence, he said, is to do the thing you fear to do and get a record of successful experiences behind you. So he forced each class member to talk at every session of the course. The audience is sympathetic. They are all in the same boat, and, by constant practice, they develop a courage, confidence and enthusiasm that carry over into their private speaking. Dale Carnegie would tell you that he made a living all these years, not by teaching public speaking, that was incidental. His main job was to help people conquer their fears and develop courage. He started out at first to conduct merely a course in public speaking, but the students who came were businessmen and women. Many of them hadn't seen the inside of a classroom in 30 years. Most of them were paying their tuition on the installment plan. They wanted results and they wanted them quick, results that they could use the next day in business interviews and in speaking before groups. So he was forced to be swift and practical. Consequently, he developed a system of training that is unique, a striking combination of public speaking, salesmanship, human relations and applied psychology. A slave to no hard and fast rules, he developed a course that is as real as the measles and twice as much fun. When the classes terminated, the graduates formed clubs of their own and continued to meet fortnightly for years afterward. One group of 19 in Philadelphia met twice a month during the winter season for 17 years. Class members frequently travel 50 or 100 miles to attend classes. One student used to commute each week from Chicago to New York. Professor William James of Harvard used to say that the average person develops only 10% of his latent mental ability. Dale Carnegie, by helping businessmen and women to develop their latent possibilities, created one of the most significant movements in adult education Lowell Thomas 1936. Part 1, Fundamental Techniques in Handling People If you want to gather honey, don't kick over the beehive On May 7, 1931, the most sensational manhunt New York City had ever known had come to its climax. After weeks of search, Two Gun, Crowley, the killer, the gunman who didn't smoke or drink, was at bay, trapped in his sweetheart's apartment on West End Avenue. 150 policemen and detectives laid siege to his top floor hideaway. They chopped holes in the roof, they tried to smoke out Crowley, the cop killer, with tear gas. Then they mounted their machine guns on surrounding buildings, and for more than an hour one of New York's fine residential areas reverberated with the crack of pistol fire and the rut-tat-tat of machine guns. Crowley, crouching behind an overstuffed chair, fired incessantly at the police. 10,000 excited people watched the battle. Nothing like it ever been seen before on the sidewalks of New York. When Crowley was captured, Police Commissioner E.P. Mulrooney declared that the two-gun desperado was one of the most dangerous criminals ever encountered in the history of New York. He will kill, said the commissioner, at the drop of a feather. But how did two-gun Crowley regard himself? We know, because while the police were firing into his apartment, he wrote a letter addressed to whom it may concern, and, as he wrote, the blood flowing from his wounds left a crimson trail on the paper. In this letter Crowley said, Under my coat is a weary heart, but a kind one, one that would do nobody any harm. A short time before this, Crowley had been having a necking party with his girlfriend on a country road out on Long Island. Suddenly a policeman walked up to the car and said, let me see your license, without saying a word, Crowley drew his gun and cut the policeman down with a shower of lead. As the dying officer fell, Crowley leaped out of the car, grabbed the officer's revolver, and fired another bullet into the prostrate body. So, with a surge of high hope, Lincoln ordered Meade not to call a council of war but to attack Lee immediately. Lincoln telegraphed his orders and then sent a special messenger to Meade demanding immediate action. And what did General Meade do? He did the very opposite of what he was told to do. He called a council of war in direct violation of Lincoln's orders. He hesitated. He procrastinated. He telegraphed all manner of excuses. He refused point blank to attack Lee. Finally, the waters receded, and Lee escaped over the Potomac with his forces. Lincoln was furious. What does this mean? Lincoln cried to his son Robert. Great God. What does this mean? We had them within our grasp and had only to stretch forth our hands and they were ours, yet nothing that I could say or do could make the army move. Under the circumstances, almost any general could have defeated Lee. If I had gone up there, I could have whipped him myself. In bitter disappointment, Lincoln sat a day down and wrote Meade this letter. And remember, at this period of his life Lincoln was extremely conservative and restrained in his phraseology. So, this letter coming from Lincoln in 1863 was tantamount to the severest rebuke. 
My dear General, I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of the misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp, and to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river, when you can take with you very few no more than two-thirds of the force you then had in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect, and I do not expect that you can now effect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. What do you suppose Meade did when he read the letter? Meade never saw that letter. Lincoln never mailed it. It was found among his papers after his death. My guess is, and this is only a guess, that after writing that letter, Lincoln looked out of the window and said to himself, just a minute. Maybe I ought not to be so hasty. It is easy enough for me to sit here in the quiet of the White House and order Meade to attack, but if I had been up at Gettysburg, and if I had seen as much blood as Meade has seen during the last week, and if my ears had been pierced with the screams and shrieks of the wounded and dying, maybe I wouldn't be so anxious to attack either. If I had Meade's timid temperament, perhaps I would have done just what he had done. Anyhow, it is water under the bridge now. If I send this letter, it will relieve my feelings, but it will make Meade try to justify himself. It will make him condemn me. It will arouse hard feelings, impair all his further usefulness as a commander, and perhaps force him to resign from the army, so, as I have already said, Lincoln put the letter aside, for he had learned by bitter experience that sharp criticisms and rebukes almost invariably end in futility. Theodore Roosevelt said that when he, as president, was confronted with a perplexing problem, he used to lean back and look up at a large painting of Lincoln which hung above his desk in the White House and ask himself, what would Lincoln do if he were in my shoes? How would he solve this problem? The next time we attempted to admonish somebody, let's pull a $5 bill out of our pocket, look at Lincoln's picture on the bill, and ask. How would Lincoln handle this problem if he had it? Mark Twain lost his temper occasionally and wrote letters that turned the paper brown. For example, he once wrote to a man who had aroused his ire, the thing for you is a burial permit. You have only to speak and I will see that you get it. On another occasion he wrote to an editor about a proofreader's attempts to improve my spelling and punctuation. He ordered, set the matter according to my copy hereafter and see that the proofreader retains his suggestions in the mush of his decayed brain. The writing of these stinging letters made Mark Twain feel better. They allowed him to blow off steam, and the letters didn't do any real harm, because Mark's wife secretly lifted them out of the mail. They were never sent. Do you know someone you would like to change and regulate and improve? Good. That is fine. I am all in favor of it, but why not begin on yourself? From a purely selfish standpoint, that is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others, yes, and a lot less dangerous. Don't complain about the snow on your neighbor's roof, said Confucius, when your own doorstep is unclean. When I was still young and trying hard to impress people, I wrote a foolish letter to Richard Harding Davis, an author who once loomed large on the literary horizon of America. I was preparing a magazine article about authors, and I asked Davis to tell me about his method of work. A few weeks earlier, I had received a letter from someone with this notation at the bottom, dictated but not read, I was quite impressed. I felt that the writer must be very big and busy and important. I wasn't the slightest bit busy, but I was eager to make an impression on Richard Harding Davis, so I ended my short note with the words, dictated but not read. He never troubled to answer the letter. He simply returned it to me with this scribbled across the bottom, your bad manners are exceeded only by your bad manners, true, I had blundered, and perhaps I deserved this rebuke. But, being human, I resented it. I resented it so sharply that when I read of the death of Richard Harding Davis ten years later, the one thought that still persisted in my mind, I am ashamed to admit, was the hurt he had given me. If you and I want to stir up a resentment tomorrow that may rankle across the decades and endure until death, just let us indulge in a little stinging criticism no matter how certain we are that it is justified. When dealing with people, let us remember we are not dealing with creatures of logic. We are dealing with creatures of emotion, creatures bristling with prejudices and motivated by pride and vanity. Bitter criticism caused the sensitive Thomas Hardy, one of the finest novelists ever to enrich English literature, to give up forever the writing of fiction. Criticism drove Thomas Chatterton, the English poet, to suicide. Benjamin Franklin, tactless in his youth, became so diplomatic, so adroit at handling people, that he was made American ambassador to France. The secret of his success. I will speak ill of no man, he said, and speak all the good I know of everybody, any fool can criticize, condemn and complain, and most fools do. But it takes character and self-control to be understanding and forgiving. 
A great man shows his greatness, said Carlyle, by the way he treats little men. Bob Hoover, a famous test pilot and frequent performer at air shows, was returning to his home in Los Angeles from an air show in San Diego. As described in the magazine Flight Operations, at 300 feet in the air, both engines suddenly stopped. By deft maneuvering he managed to land the plane, but it was badly damaged although nobody was hurt. Hoover's first act after the emergency landing was to inspect the airplane's fuel. Just as he suspected, the World War II propeller plane he had been flying had been fueled with jet fuel rather than gasoline. Upon returning to the airport, he asked to see the mechanic who had serviced his airplane. The young man was sick with the agony of his mistake. Tears streamed down his face as Hoover approached. He had just caused the loss of a very expensive plane and could have caused the loss of three lives as well. You can imagine Hoover's anger. One could anticipate the tongue lashing that this proud and precise pilot would unleash for that carelessness. But Hoover didn't scold the mechanic, he didn't even criticize him. Instead, he put his big arm around the man's shoulder and said, to show you I'm sure that you'll never do this again, I want you to service my F-51 tomorrow, often parents attempted to criticize their children. So that was what adults wanted to study, was it? All right, said the people making the survey. Fine. If that is what they want, we'll give it to them. Looking around for a textbook, they discovered that no working manual had ever been written to help people solve their daily problems in human relationships. Here was a fine kettle of fish. For hundreds of years, learned volumes had been written on Greek and Latin and higher mathematics, topics about which the average adult doesn't give two hoots. But on the one subject on which he has a thirst for knowledge, a veritable passion for guidance and help, nothing. This explained the presence of 2,500 eager adults crowding into the grand ballroom of the Hotel Pennsylvania in response to a newspaper advertisement. Here, apparently, at last was the thing for which they had long been seeking. Back in high school and college, they had pored over books, believing that knowledge alone was the open sesame to financial and professional rewards. But a few years in the rough and tumble of business and professional life had brought sharp disillusionment. They had seen some of the most important business successes won by men who possessed, in addition to their knowledge, the ability to talk well, to win people to their way of thinking, and to sell themselves and their ideas. They soon discovered that if one aspired to wear the captain's cap and navigate the ship of business, personality and the ability to talk are more important than a knowledge of Latin verbs or a sheepskin from Harvard. The advertisement in the New York Sun promised that the meeting would be highly entertaining. It was. 18 people who had taken the course were marshaled in front of the loudspeaker, and 15 of them were given precisely 75 seconds each to tell his or her story. Only 75 seconds of talk, then bang, went the gavel, and the chairman shouted, time. Next speaker. The affair moved with the speed of a herd of buffalo thundering across the plains. Spectators stood for an hour and a half to watch the performance. The speakers were a cross-section of life, several sales representatives, a chain store executive, a baker, the president of a trade association, two bankers, an insurance agent, an accountant, a dentist, an architect, a druggist who had come from Indianapolis to New York to take the course, a lawyer who had come from Havana in order to prepare himself to give one important three-minute speech. The first speaker bore the Gaelic name Patrick J. O'Hare. Born in Ireland, he attended school for only four years, drifted to America, worked as a mechanic, then as a chauffeur. Now, however, he was 40, he had a growing family and needed more money, so he tried selling trucks. Suffering from an inferiority complex that, as he put it, was eating his heart out, he had to walk up and down in front of an office half a dozen times before he could summon up enough courage to open the door. He was so discouraged as a salesman that he was thinking of going back to working with his hands in a machine shop, when one day he received a letter inviting him to an organization meeting of the Dale Carnegie course in effective speaking. He didn't want to attend. He feared he would have to associate with a lot of college graduates, that he would be out of place. His despairing wife insisted that he go, saying, it may do you some good, Pat. God knows you need it. He went down to the place where the meeting was to be held and stood on the sidewalk for five minutes before he could generate enough self-confidence to enter the room. The first few times he tried to speak in front of the others, he was dizzy with fear. But as the weeks drifted by, he lost all fear of audiences and soon found that he loved to talk, the bigger the crowd, the better. And he also lost his fear of individuals and of his superiors. He presented his ideas to them, and soon he had been advanced into the sales department. He had become a valued and much-liked member of his company. 
This night, in the Hotel Pennsylvania, Patrick O'Hare stood in front of 2,500 people and told a gay, rollicking story of his achievements. Wave after wave of laughter swept over the audience. Few professional speakers could have equaled his performance. The next speaker, Godfrey Mayer, was a grey-headed banker, the father of 11 children. The first time he had attempted to speak in class, he was literally struck dumb. His mind refused to function. His story is a vivid illustration of how leadership gravitates to the person who can talk. He worked on Wall Street, and for 25 years he had been living in Clifton, New Jersey. During that time, he had taken no active part in community affairs and knew perhaps 500 people. Shortly after he had enrolled in the Carnegie course, he received his tax bill and was infuriated by what he considered unjust charges. Ordinarily, he would have sat a day at home and fumed, or he would have taken it out in grousing to his neighbors. But instead, he put on his hat that night, walked into the town meeting, and blew off steam in public. As a result of that talk of indignation, the citizens of Clifton, New Jersey, urged him to run for the town council. So for weeks he went from one meeting to another, denouncing waste and municipal extravagance. There were 96 candidates in the field. When the ballots were counted, lo, Godfrey Mayer's name led all the rest. Almost overnight, he had become a public figure among the 40,000 people in his community. As a result of his talks, he made 80 times more friends in six weeks than he had been able to previously in 25 years. And his salary as councilman meant that he got a return of 1,000% a year on his investment in the Carnegie course. The third speaker, the head of a large national association of food manufacturers, told how he had been unable to stand up and express his ideas at meetings of a board of directors. As a result of learning to think on his feet, two astonishing things happened. He was soon made president of his association, and in that capacity, he was obliged to address meetings all over the United States. Excerpts from his talks were put on the associated press wires and printed in newspapers and trade magazines throughout the country. In two years, after learning to speak more effectively, he received more free publicity for his company and its products than he had been able to get previously with a quarter of a million dollars spent in direct advertising. This speaker admitted that he had formally hesitated to telephone some of the more important business executives in Manhattan and invite them to lunch with him. But as a result of the prestige he had acquired by his talks, these same people telephoned him and invited him to lunch and apologized to him for encroaching on his time. The ability to speak is a shortcut to distinction. It puts a person in the limelight, raises one head and shoulders above the crowd. And the person who can speak acceptably is usually given credit for an ability out of all proportion to what he or she really possesses. A movement for adult education has been sweeping over the nation, and the most spectacular force in that movement was Dale Carnegie, a man who listened to and critiqued more talks by adults than has any other man in captivity. According to a cartoon by, believe it or not, Ripley, he had criticized 150,000 speeches. If that grand total doesn't impress you, remember that it meant one talk for almost every day that has passed since Columbus discovered America. Or, to put it in other words, if all the people who had spoken before him had used only three minutes and had appeared before him in succession, it would have taken ten months, listening day and night, to hear them all. Dale Carnegie's own career, filled with sharp contrasts, was a striking example of what a person can accomplish when obsessed with an original idea and afire with enthusiasm. Born on a Missouri farm 10 miles from a railway, he never saw a streetcar until he was 12 years old, yet by the time he was 46, he was familiar with the far-flung corners of the earth, everywhere from Hong Kong to Hammerfest, and, at one time, he approached closer to the North Pole than Admiral Byrd's headquarters at Little America was to the South Pole. This Missouri lad who had once picked strawberries and cut cockleburs for five cents an hour became the highly paid trainer of the executives of large corporations in the art of self-expression. This erstwhile cowboy who had once punched cattle and branded calves and ridden fences out in western South Dakota later went to London to put on shows under the patronage of the royal family. This chap who was a total failure the first half dozen times he tried to speak in public later became my personal manager. Much of my success has been due to training under Dale Carnegie. Young Carnegie had to struggle for an education, for hard luck was always battering away at the old farm in northwest Missouri with a flying tackle and a body slam. Year after year, the 102 river rose and drowned the corn and swept away the hay. Season after season, the fat hogs sickened and died from cholera, the bottom fell out of the market for cattle and mules, and the bank threatened to foreclose the mortgage. Sick with discouragement, the family sold out and bought another farm near the State Teachers College at Warrensburg, Missouri. 
Board and room could be had in town for a dollar a day, but young Carnegie couldn't afford it. So he stayed on the farm and commuted on horseback three miles to college each day. At home, he milked the cows, cut the wood, fed the hogs, and studied his Latin verbs by the light of a coal oil lamp until his eyes blurred and he began to nod. We won first prizes by the score. My father pinned his blue ribbons on a sheet of white muslin, and when friends or visitors came to the house, he would get out the long sheet of muslin. He would hold one end and I would hold the other while he exhibited the blue ribbons. The hogs didn't care about the ribbons they had won. But father did. These prizes gave him a feeling of importance. If our ancestors hadn't had this flaming urge for a feeling of importance, civilization would have been impossible. Without it, we should have been just about like animals. It was this desire for a feeling of importance that led an uneducated, poverty-stricken grocery clerk to study some law books he found in the bottom of a barrel of household plunder that he had bought for 50 cents. You have probably heard of this grocery clerk. His name was Lincoln. It was this desire for a feeling of importance that inspired Dickens to write his immortal novels. This desire inspired Sir Christopher Wren to design his symphonies in stone. This desire made Rockefeller amass millions that he never spent. And this same desire made the richest family in your town build a house far too large for its requirements. This desire makes you want to wear the latest styles, drive the latest cars, and talk about your brilliant children. It is this desire that lures many boys and girls into joining gangs and engaging in criminal activities. The average young criminal, according to E.P. Mulrooney, one-time police commissioner of New York, is filled with ego, and his first request after arrest is for those lurid newspapers that make him out a hero. The disagreeable prospect of serving time seems remote so long as he can gloat over his likeness sharing space with pictures of sports figures, movie and TV stars and politicians. If you tell me how you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. That determines your character. That is the most significant thing about you. For example, John D. Rockefeller got his feeling of importance by giving money to erect a modern hospital in Peking, China, to care for millions of poor people whom he had never seen and never would see. Dillinger, on the other hand, got his feeling of importance by being a bandit, a bank robber and killer. When the FBI agents were hunting him, he dashed into a farmhouse up in Minnesota and said, I'm Dillinger. He was proud of the fact that he was public enemy number one. I'm not going to hurt you, but I'm Dillinger, he said. Yes, the one significant difference between Dillinger and Rockefeller is how they got the feeling of importance. History sparkles with amusing examples of famous people struggling for a feeling of importance. Even George Washington wanted to be called, His Mightiness, the President of the United States, and Columbus pleaded for the title, Admiral of the Ocean and Viceroy of India, Catherine the Great refused to open letters that were not addressed to, Her Imperial Majesty, and Mrs. Lincoln, in the White House, turned upon Mrs. Grant like a tigress and shouted, How dare you be seated in my presence until I invite you? Our millionaires helped finance Admiral Byrd's expedition to the Antarctic in 1928 with the understanding that ranges of icy mountains would be named after them, and Victor Hugo aspired to have nothing less than the city of Paris renamed in his honor. Even Shakespeare, mightiest of the mighty, tried to add luster to his name by procuring a coat of arms for his family. People sometimes became invalids in order to win sympathy and attention and get a feeling of importance. For example, take Mrs. McKinley. She got a feeling of importance by forcing her husband, the President of the United States, to neglect important affairs of state while he reclined on the bed beside her for hours at a time, his arm about her, soothing her to sleep. She fed her gnawing desire for attention by insisting that he remain with her while she was having her teeth fixed, and once created a stormy scene when he had to leave her alone with the dentist while he kept an appointment with John Hay, his Secretary of State. The writer Mary Roberts Reinhardt once told me of a bright, vigorous young woman who became an invalid in order to get a feeling of importance. One day, said Mrs. Reinhardt, this woman had been obliged to face something, her age perhaps.